Good morning, Bruins. My name is Ashley Ray Kemper, and I'm a proud Bruin and serve as the Director of Alumni Events here at the UCLA Alumni Association. Thank you so much for joining us today for Alumni Day Online. It's great to have you with us. This hour, we'll, we'll be exploring electronic dance music, the underground scene, and the growing diversity of the industry through an interactive Q&A session with Micah Smith and Andrew Conde. Micah and Andrew are both Bruins and currently work as a part of a production team at the record label Understated. They plan events, music releases, promote a market artist centered around electronic dance music, or EDM for short. They use an underground approach to foster a sense of community, diversity, and inclusion through music. Before we get started, I want to thank our Blue, Gold, and Life members for making events like Alumni Day possible. It's through your generous contributions and continued support that we're able to plan events and provide resources for all Bruins. Today, we hope that it'll be a highly interactive one. We ask, um, you can ask direct questions through the episode by using the live chat, so don't be shy. We'll try to answer as many as possible. Now let's get started. Micah and Andrew, tell us a little bit about yourselves and how you got to where you are today. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Andrew Conde. Uh, like Ashley said, graduated from UCLA in 2015 as a music history major, which is where uh, Micah and I met in class. Um, I was actually a transfer, so I uh, was only at UCLA for two years, but man, I miss those two years a lot. Um, yeah, I mean, I've always been a big music fan since I was, um, you know, in uh, middle school and in high school, and I uh, <clears throat> kind of always dreamed of working for a record label. Um, and while I was at UCLA, I uh, had this internship um, for a company called Label Engine, and um, that's kind of where I got my introduction to working with independent record labels and lots and lots of electronic music uh, coming up from the underground. Um, and then, yeah, I actually, uh, my day job, I work for that company now. Um, and that was the inter internship I had while I was at UCLA. Um, but it's, you know, it's allowed me to, or it's empowered me to like, um, kind of have the knowledge to be able to say, hey, like we should start our own record label and that's how the label side of Understated came about. Um, my name is Micah uh, and I graduated UCLA 2015 as well. Uh, although I started back in 2009 and then I took a couple years off because I wasn't sure what I wanted to study. Um, and I eventually settled on music history, like you said, where we met. Um, but, you know, I really got like my start with the event planning, like when I was in my fraternity working as social chair. Um, and I was always fascinated with you know, how you can bring people together and kind of cultivate a certain vibe and energy in the room, just based on like the decor and the music and the, the group of people that you get together. Um, so it's always been kind of in the back of my mind. And then, you know, I've been a DJ for about nine years now. Uh, I started playing at UCLA and then started doing different bar gigs. And I realized that wasn't quite fulfilling me just working as a DJ. So I took a little bit of time off from it um, to really figure out my game plan. Um, and then ultimately I found myself at a warehouse in downtown one night and I had this vision of, you know, a community coming together in, in this space that I found. Um, and after that, I, you know, I took, uh, I just, I got Andrew involved. I got Michael and Zach involved and, and uh, Nanglin and McKenna as well. And kind of just put the team together. And I, we didn't really event, originally envision it to be a label or a bigger lifestyle brand. We just kind of wanted to throw a party and see how it went. Um, and we had, it's really tremendous showing for our first party. We had like 450 people out there and, you know, we realized that we had tapped into something special and, you know, we've been, that was about two years ago and we've been just continuing to push the brand forward ever since. That's really awesome. Um, so, you know, you kind of took this vision. What was like the main motivation for getting understated started? Um, you know, honestly, I was in a kind of a dark place in my life and, you know, I went to this venue and I saw, saw people like, just like lifting each other up and, you know, really supporting each other in ways that I never saw at like, you know, the big, big scale productions, you know, the Insomniac events, the hard events, those bigger, those bigger productions who seem to be like lacking in that, that sense of community. So really it came down to like wanting to create a space for people to come together and support each other. That's really awesome. Um, have you both always been interested in EDM music? Ever since, for me, it was ever since I first went to EDC in 2009. Um, you know, I caught the bug immediately, and my tastes of different preferences within dance music have definitely evolved and matured a lot. 
but I've been, but it's been, you know, almost my entire adult life. I've been passionate about it. Um, yeah. And for me, uh, my first EMC was, you know, really what secured me too. And that was in 2010. Um, but I had been, um, you know, a big fan of just like all of the, uh, random dance music that hit the radio, uh, when I was younger and then I was always looking um, for more, but it was, it was very much less successful when I was younger. So like the big, uh, the big radio hits, like <laughs> Sandstorm and mm -hmm. Alice DJ, Better Off Alone, and, you know, like uh, names like Moby, Basement Jacks, anything that would kind of like sneak its way onto uh, terrestrial radio. I grew up in Kansas City, so it was, it was definitely uh, like less successful and a little bit more behind on what was up and coming. But uh, yeah, even since I was a kid, I was like, you know, anything with a you know, like a floor to the floor beat, like always caught my ear. Uh, but it wasn't until I moved out here until, uh, you know, I really solidified my, my love for it and became kind of like a lifelong fan, I'd say. That's great. So for someone who doesn't really know a lot about EDM, are there main like subgenres within the category that people follow or how does that work? Yeah, I would say, I mean, the main, the big, the big genres are, you know, would be like house, techno, and then all the various forms of bass. Those are kind of the three, the three main styles. And then each of them has a lot of different spinoffs, um, you know, but there's, you know, they're kind of around like 2011 to 2014 was like, there was a big consolidation in the industry and a lot of those styles kind of started to blend together. So, you know, now, like, you know, if somebody kind of collectively refers to something as, like, EDM, it can it will generally, like, have, you know, elements of all of those styles in it, you know, and then, you know, some people that have more specific preferences will, you know, you got, like, your house heads and you got, like, techno bands and, you know, they intermingle a little bit, but, on, you know, for the bigger scale events, everything is kind of all mixed together and the smaller ones are a little more focused on one specific sound. Yeah, and just to add on to that, there's, I mean, that's the kind of beautiful thing about it is like there are like new sub 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 genres created like, like every week. Probably, <laughs> probably, there probably have been a few that have been coined uh, during this hour that we're talking. So yeah. <laughs> that's that's the awesome thing. It's so dynamic and you know all these influences create dance music. So yeah, and, really also, cool. and also with things like you know things like SoundCloud and MixCloud, there's a lot of ways that independent artists can distribute their music. So there's mm -hmm. not that there's not that huge barrier to entry like there was in the nineties to make a record. So, I mean, really anybody around the world can very, very easily make, not easily make the music, but you know, they can make the music and it's, you know, if it's good, they can very easily distribute it worldwide, which wasn't really even a thing 15 years ago. That is the great part about technology and kind of having everything at your fingertips. So people are able to access that really easily. Um, so, Micah, in the Daily Bruin article, Alumni Create Underground EDM Project with Focus on Inclusion and Community, you talked about how EDM scene had lost a lot of its authenticity. Can you explain this more? Yeah, you know, I, what I noticed was it, it started to be a lot more about being seen at the events than actually enjoying them. You have a lot of people, like, getting super dressed up and, like, taking pic you know, spending the whole night taking pictures and selfies and uploading them on social media while they're there. Um, rather than like coming together and talking to each other and dancing with each other and interacting with each other. Um, and it's, it started to feel like a lot of people were there for the wrong reasons. Um, and I also, you know, based on some of the artists I would talk to, it seemed like a lot of the artists were more concerned with just like being the life of the party and the center of attention rather than creating like good art. So I feel like, I feel like a lot of people just started to get into it for the wrong reasons once it became popular and once there was, you know, a lot of money on the table. Um, and I feel like, you know, overall, at least in America, where my experience have been, I feel like the music scene really took a hit. Um, you know, I, I, the way I understand is that it's a little bit different in Europe because it's, it didn't have this big explosion. It just kind of was always popular and accepted there. Um, so what I, what I wanted to do is kind of, you know, create a place where it would be really just about the music and the people coming together. Um, and obviously I don't mind if somebody wants to take a picture at our show, but you know, we have, you know, I don't, I feel like that should not be the main focus, you know, and it shouldn't matter whether you upload a video to Instagram, like while you're at the party or wait till the next day. Yeah. I mean, I'll just add on to that a little bit, um, kind of just paint a little like picture about kind of the experience of like an understated event. I mean, um, Mike has been mentioning like, you know, the big production, um, like big stages, like our events are essentially the opposite of that where, you know, um, uh, like the 
DJ and the crowd are on, like on the same plane. Um, oftentimes, like people in the crowd can walk behind the DJ. It's just like it, you know, we we you know we physically kind of promote that that sense of community, and it's just like yeah. everyone on the dance floor together, and not this kind of hierarchy of like everyone. Yeah. Stage. yeah, and at a lot of like the bigger events and the nightclubs, you know, the DJ will come and play their set and then they'll just hang out in the VIP room the whole time. I mean, you know, we have a room behind our stage, but we don't, it's not a VIP room and, you know, anybody can go in there until it gets a little too crowded and then we have to like clear it out a bit. But, you know, we try to get rid of those divisions and create like a very egalitarian community. That's great. So we actually have um, a live question from Eric. He's wondering, how have platforms like SoundCloud allow artists to self-publish impacted the EDM scene and the economics of it? Sure, yeah. I mean, I think a huge part of electronic music is um, mixes and remix culture. And I think um, those both of those formats can really thrive on SoundCloud because it's kind of one of the only manual upload platforms where you know you don't have to go through like a distributor to get on there like, you can just create an account upload music like same with youtube um so um you know it just moves at such a fast pace that like someone can just upload an acapella and then the next thing you know like yeah, five within a remixes. week there's like 500 <laughs> remixes you know if that acapella is good um so yeah, SoundCloud is like, you know, it was in trouble for a little bit, but I don't think it's going anywhere because it's just yeah. such a unique thing and it, you know, it pushes forward, um, you know, collaboration very yeah. much so. Yeah, you, all, you also have a lot of, what's really been cool about SoundCloud recently is you have a lot of these organizations of whatever type putting out music that's not originally musical content, it's just audio content for people to hear, you know, different samples of recorded speeches and you know, NASA uploads all of their audio recordings that they take from all over the, every different direction in the universe. And, you know, you see a lot, they put those all out for free on SoundCloud, and you see a lot of producers using those in their work, like myself included. Um, you know, for a while, I had a little phase for a while where I would use at least one of those NASA samples every time because it was just something like a little bit otherworldly that you weren't necessarily hearing all the time. Well, that's really interesting. So are there other companies that are, like, recording sounds that artists can then use to incorporate into their music? Yeah, there's a lot of companies that, you know, that make audio record audios like samples specifically for that. And, you know, they do, they all sell them on different websites, but you, but most of them have, you know, places where they'll have them available for free as well. Like Music Radar is one of my favorites. You know, every week they put out a different free pack, which is like, you know, 50 to 100 megabytes. And then there's also like a full pack that you can buy that's like 100 gigabytes of that stuff, like similar material. That's very cool. Yeah, and that's actually something eventually that like we'd like to be able to do as well is like work with artists to create to create different sort audio source material that we can share with producers. Um, so we actually have another live question from Brian. Um, he asked, "How ha um, has the music business shifted from selling recorded slash downloaded music to an emphasis on performing? Is the recorded music more of a market tool to promote the live performances?" Absolutely, I would say that's very accurate. Um, one of my teachers actually told us on the first day of our music industry class that you're not in the music business, you're in the tickets and t-shirts business. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that really spoke to me. You know, it's like we're in an era where, you know, there's not a lot of money in recording music. And even if you make a hit record, like you're maybe going to see like a couple thousand dollars. Um, and that's kind of the extent of it. But you know, all you can do is really like adapt to the times and, you know, some people see, oh, this is like the death of the music industry, but I like to see it as it's more kind of starting to evolve. Um, and I think it's just important to kind of like stay ahead of those changes. Andrew, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree there. It's definitely more of a shift. Um, and I think like, you know, um, music rights and everything is kind of just, you know, with, with everything kind of like, the law is kind of always behind technology, you know, so there's lots of new ways royalties are being generated. Um, I actually deal with a lot of this through my work at Create Music Group, um, but we're finding new ways to like, um, basically uh, monetize content online. Um, you know, I mentioned like SoundCloud and YouTube, and um, those are just new platforms that still are being navigated. Uh, we like to call them like the wild, wild west. So I think um, sounds like our parties. Yeah, <laughs> I think that uh, I think that uh, like uh, like 
recorded music revenues and like streaming revenues are you know on their way up like um i mean it all started back with like napster but like today like spotify is just like you know making a huge splash and all the other streaming platforms out there apple music even too um but yeah i think um you know i think it'll things will balance out a little bit and then artists will start realizing that there are ways to make money off of world is not yeah not only have to rely on live performances yeah another thing that's you know that i've been thinking about a bit quite a bit recently is um you know when you go to a, when you go to a bar or a restaurant or whatever and you hear music a song playing like you know they're paying you know maybe half a cent or a cent every time that gets played that song gets played and you know there's really nothing like that that's like really in full swing right now for djs playing at events so you know when i go to a you know, when I go to a club and it's like I buy the songs from the artists, you know, for two dollars each, and I play twenty songs, but they're those, you know, they're, those royalties aren't coming back to them every time that I play them. Um, you know, people are very torn up and conflicted about that. There's a lot of companies that are working on systems to track those, to track those plays. Um, but I think that once we get to a point where, like, you know, the content creators are getting paid for when their music is going in DJ sets, then it'll kind of just blow the industry wide open because there's. You know, people are there's like hundreds of thousands of DJ mixes being recorded and posted everywhere. You know, and right now there's really not not like a real channel to like get these people paid. And a lot of the DJs want us to be able to support the the creators of the music they're playing. That's right. Yeah, and as you know, as a label, like we we want to be able to help support our artists in that way too. So that's something we we really hope for uh, improves through the years. Um, so we have another question from um, Turnwords. They ask, um, people say they meet the most amazing people at EDC spaces, um, but are these relationships just momentary? Like, have you had any that last? Um, I think, you know, at the big, it's difficult sometimes at the bigger, bigger scale events, you know, like an EDC or a hard, um, you know, there's just so many people in chat for a second and it's, you know, so there's an emphasis on like love and respect and inclusion, but you know, like in all seriousness, like a lot of that is like mediated by drugs. And sometimes like, you know, you'll, you'll, you wonder like, are, is this person going to be somebody that I care to like interact with when I'm sober? Um, and you know, we, we, we try to get away from that and we, you know, we try to make it really be about like people coming together and building real relationships. I mean, I can think of like so many of my friends who came to LA and like didn't really know anyone. And like, because of coming to these underground parties, like they feel like they have a community now. But I feel like it's a little different when you, you know you can go out every weekend and kind of start to see the same people and get to know them, you know, both in and out of the party scene. That's great. Um, so, it, what advice would you give current students that are looking to pursue a career in music? And then, when you were students, did you kind of have a different idea of where your professional life was headed? Um, I would say the number one piece of advice: fifty percent of your time working on your craft, fifty percent of your time building your network. Um, you know, so many people are just focused on one or the other, um, but you really need both. You know, you have a lot of people like spending hours and hours every day pre promoting mediocre music that would really be improved if they just spent a little more time working on the products. And you also have a lot of people that make incredible music but don't have the network to make anything happen with it. Um, so it's really important to balance those two desires. And, you know, also just to keep an open mind about, you know, incorporating new musical styles like taking advice from people that you might not think are able to give you advice and just really being open-minded and being a, being a sponge for everything around you. Um, for me, I, uh, I'm a huge proponent of internships because I, I feel like I, I landed a couple like really, for me at the time, that like, you know, unreal gigs just by, you know, doing an internship that I didn't think would really lead to somewhere like I, on my first one of my first internships before I was actually doing independent label stuff was for a recording studio. And it was just like, you know, uh, I didn't really have that much audio engineering experience, but um, I gained a lot on, on the job. And I kind of, I think I just got the interview just by having a positive attitude, which is another thing I definitely suggest, but I ended up, you know, working my way up through studios. And then uh, my last studio position before fully moving to the label world is, um, was working at Capital Studios. Um, so that all that all was due to just like being like, okay, well, I'm gonna, you know, I'm in school, but I'm gonna take the take my free time and and do an internship and learn on the job. Yeah, if I could piggyback on that, I would say really just like 
pay your dues, mm -hmm. you know, and that can mean different totally. things for different people. You know, for Andrew, it was like a series of internships that led him to these amazing jobs that gave him the skills to like turn our party series into a record label that we wouldn't have been able to do without him. You know, for me, it was a lot of like playing gigs that I didn't necessarily want to take, like playing at the beginning of the night to an empty room for no money. Um, you know, like writing, working, writing for blogs and just really, but knowing that like none of this comes easy and like you need to like take the time to really like, you know, really learn the industry, whatever, and learn, you know, really figure out a plan and before you just like dive head first into it. 100%. Great. Um, so we have another question from you, Silly Spark. It says, hey guys, congrats on the early success. How do you use social media? an online meeting and awareness building space to get people to take the next step, buy tickets and come to your events in real life. Sure, yeah. Oh man, social media is uh, <laughs> such a necessary evil sometimes, but yeah, you know, sure. it's a big part of, of the way we get people excited about events and I think a large part in, uh, to the like, visual mm -hmm. content that we put out. Um, we worked uh, early on with a designer named David who, who was kind of the uh, kind of the mastermind behind all of the, the visual aesthetic of understated and just like, you know, we just knowing things like, oh, you know, video content does really well on Facebook. So we make sure to, to post some kind of visual, like animated visual for an event. Um, what else? Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say the biggest thing I would say is that, I mean, if your product and your brand aren't well defined, social media really isn't going to get you that far. Um, and on first and foremost, it's about the experience and the aesthetic that you're trying to create. Um, and the social media really is just a tool to promote that. It's not this magic wand that's going to get people to show up at your parties. You know, but if you, you know, if you throw, you know, if you put creative experience that people enjoy and you ask them to follow you, like mm -hmm. chances are they're going to follow you because they want to be able to experience that again. Yeah. And it's just a question of like, you know, giving, you know, creating this experience that people will enjoy and not relying, you know, obviously like you use the social media as a tool, but you don't use it as a crutch. Yeah. And we have, we, we've been blessed to have like, um, you know, just like close friends of ours and people that have attended our events that, you know, kind of, it's like word of mouth, but on social media that have just been like, you know, telling their friends about, about the events and inviting them without us even asking them to do so. You know, we're very fortunate to have those people on our side. Yeah. Do you find that you have success on a certain platform more than others, or do you try to utilize all of them in different aspects? I would say primarily Facebook and Instagram. Yeah, a little bit of Twitter, but it hasn't that we haven't used that as much as the others. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, Facebook and Instagram are both great, and they have you know they offer you something very different. You know, Instagram is very good at like solidifying that visual aesthetic. Um, you know, but they, but at the same time, you know, Facebook has like events and they have different pages you can follow and it's, you know, you can share more, like more detailed content on there. So how, in like each of your own words, how would you describe EDM to someone who's never heard about it before? Um, I would say it's like a quasi spiritual experience. Um, you know, it's people coming together and leaving behind like whatever is at the door, you know, whatever stress is, is stressing them out or bringing them down, they leave that at the door and they come together and they experience these moments of bliss and euphoria. Um, and those moments like can really like bring people together and get them through rough times. Um, so in terms of the experience, like that's how I describe it. The music, it's, I mean, it's kind of hard to really like describe EDM as music because it's so, there's so many different styles. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, like it's supposed to make you dance. Um, it's supposed to have energy and it's supposed to make you feel emotional with things. Totally. Um, yeah, but I, but I like, you know, like if you want to get like a little more technical, you know, it's like it has like its roots and like funk and disco and soul, um, you know, and then over the last, you know, 40 years, it's kind of taken influence from almost every style. I can't think of a single style that hasn't influenced dance music in some way. That's awesome. Um, we actually have an, another live question um, from Rex. He's asking, um, what did Understated take to leverage their brewing community? They mentioned internships, but were these found outside or inside UCLA? Um, well, the internships were before we actually started Understated. Um, I never did an internship, but Andrew took a couple. Um, but what has been you know, really helpful in like engaging the UCLA community has been the EDM club. Um, and Andrew can speak more to that because he's been 
far more involved with that than I have over the years. Yeah, um, it, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, UCLA EMC was started in 2012, and it's this, it's this amazing club that people like message, I swear, people message the, the group before they even are admitted into the school, and they're like, how do I become part of this? Hmm. And I was like totally following the page before I transferred. Hmm. Um, and there's just some really amazing, passionate people in there that it's kind of it's kind of turned more into like a little music industry hub. And um, there's a, there are like um, kind of other alumni that have gone through there, have um, gone on to work some ama amazing like music industry, but electronic music industry positions. Um, yeah, I mean, um, and they also like you know they they're they're probably most consistent in attendance to like there's always at least someone from the club that comes out to our events and yeah. it's just like i can't remember the last time we didn't have like a <laughs> decent you know, a decent showing from edmc even like the ones who are not 21 it's like they're like they'll tell us like oh, we can't wait till we turn 21 yeah. so we can come out to like a real party shout out edmc yeah, shout okay. out <laughs> and andrew is being andrew's being modest but he was actually like a big part of like why edmc was able to grow to what it was um you know they were kind of it was kind of, things were kind of slowing down a little bit and he came in you know like was it your senior year or right after yeah uh senior is your yeah it was your senior yeah, my year. Last year. our senior year and yeah he he was a big part of like the you know they called it the reboot I mean, <laughs> they brought in a lot of he brought a lot of fresh energy and ideas and helped grow it to something that was really special yeah actually i mean on that part some of it kind of landed in our lab but like um you mentioned insomniac before but they actually reached out to the club to, to throw or to do like an on-campus masterclass with Richie Houghton. It was like, you know, for those who don't know, like a techno legend. So he came and did like a masterclass, brought a bunch of like bent, like music tech vendors. And so we much just, fun. We were just like, how did this happen? But that was kind of my first taste of like organizing an event. And I was like, oh man, I'm in over my head. But like the, you know, we had a bunch of volunteers from, from EDMC come out and like staff the event and like, a couple of them I remember I was like, hey, can you guys go get coffee for Richie Houghton? And they're like, yes. And then they just like ran and grabbed it from like, uh, you know, from uh, Kirk Austin. So maybe it was kind of like an internship for them too. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, that was that was all in like spring of 2015. Um, that kind of launched me in the direction of like events. And, you know, yeah, that's when I knew for sure I wanted to work in the music industry. It's great to see that support too. That's awesome. Um, we have a question from Brian. Yes, um, how has going to UCLA allowed you to grow and prosper in your musical careers? Um, I say first and foremost, like the people that I met there have been incredibly supportive, incredibly talented as well. Um, you know, I met Andrew and also Zach and England there. Um, and then David as well, or old designer David as well. Um, so the network was important. Also, you know, being in a fraternity allowed me to kind of have that experience of like rallying people up and getting them excited for an event and making the event happen. Um, and then, you know, also the music industry courses, we both minored in music industry. So that was, that taught us a lot. Um, and then, you know, we also did like a unofficial recording class up in the film school, like our last couple of years. And that, that taught me a lot of what I know about music production right now. Shout out to you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely shout out to David, man. You guys are watching. Um, yeah, I mean, to add on to that, um, just the proximity to, you know, Hollywood and downtown Los Angeles, it's just like, you know, like you may come to UCLA from another state and just like kind of get, you know, comfortable. Like Westwood is very nice and like there's like, you know, downtown Westwood is great to hang out in all the time, but definitely get out there and like see what the entertainment industry has to offer. and. Um, I think I kind of like took that aspect of it for granted because I grew up in LA. Um, but I, but I see, you know, all my friends that have come from LA also all say the same thing. It's, you know, it's so great coming here and being in LA and being in the center of it. Yeah. And uh, uh, to touch more on like uh, kind of our major and minor specifically, like we have a history of EDM class, which is, you know, you know, millions of people over the world would, would love to be in that kind of class. And we have that at UCLA and, it's such a great class. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Fink does a great job. Bank, yeah. Mr. Fink does That's a great job with it. Um, and I actually took it from Mike Dierico over the summer, and oh, man, uh, he was a PhD student at the time. But I, 
like it kind of filled in all the gaps for me and you know like uh i think us being like music history nerds like really helps kind of um with our brand and allows us to like you know understand that we need to know what's always up and coming and bubbling from the underground but also be drawing back from history and the roots of like house music and kind of where it came from all that so uh i think being in la situated in la and and having all the resources that UCLA has to offer is, is, has definitely empowered us. So kind of going off that question, we have another question from Monica. Um, asks, outside of campus and UCLA resources, are there professional network groups to help cultivate music industry contacts? And like, for example, finding a job? Yeah, there's a lot of, um, there's definitely a lot of you know, industry meetups and mixers. I'm kind of blanking on the people that put them on, the names of the groups that put them on. Um, yeah, well, uh, first one I thought of, there's a Facebook group that's growing. Oh, am I CNG? Yeah, Music yeah, Industry yeah. Career Network group. It's a really great group. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a private group, but if anybody wants to, like, email the understated page, like, we can send you an invite through that. That's been actually really helpful. Like, so know, many connections can you make. I know so many people who have gotten jobs from that page as well. Um, you know, I used to go to this weekly, like, networking meetup in Hollywood, but I'm blanking on what the name of what it was. I would, um... I would suggest uh, like uh, the Recording Academy as well. Like um, I know they do a lot of uh, they do like memberships for students, and you know they were you know they, they put on the Grammys, so you're getting like the full broad scope of of recording and, and all genres and that kind of thing. Um, yeah. That's definitely a great. Yeah, I think place. another thing to keep but another great place like for networking is at underground parties. You know, especially when you show up early and you interview. You know introduce yourself to the promoter, you know, you ask them if they need any help with anything. And next thing you know, you've like got a chance to meet all your favorite artists. And yeah, yeah that, and a lot of the, a lot of the networking is kind of happening like at ground zero at these events too. Um, you know, when you, you know, going to like a industry group, professional group where it's the purpose of it is mm -hmm. to network, it's the connections don't always feel as like genuine and authentic. Very true. And I mean, with, I mean, to jump on that too, um, just like go up and talk to people because like, all of us people or people that work in the industry we're we're just as big if not bigger music fans so yeah we're always, always happy to talk to people yeah. and share what we know and help in any way we can i guess you never know who you're going to meet at an event and what it could yeah, be totally. um so how can diversity and inclusivity further develop within the edm culture um yeah so um a lot a big part of that is um i think Michael was saying um, at the beginning, kind of like the crowd is a big part of it. Um, you know, just when you go to an event, just kind of have an open mind and what uh, it kind of relates to what I just said, like going up to talk, going up to talking to people, asking people like, like, you know, listening to their story kind of thing. But also on the industry side, um, you know, there's lots of movements um, about like, you know, equality and like bookings and like, you know? Yeah. So, so one, for example, like one of the things we really try to make a focus on is like trying to book more female artists. Um, you know, it's, we def it's definitely become kind of like an industry that's dominated by like, you know, straight white men. And, you know, that wasn't, you know, originally it was, you know, house music was started by like the gay black community as a response to like prejudice and discrimination against disco music. Um, and it's, you know, it's important to just remember like what the roots are. Um, and to be like, you know, supporting people, like supporting artists, like regardless of like what, you know, what their ethnicity or sexual preference or gender is, because ultimately at the end of the day, like what it's all about is the music. There's a lot of people that are being like, you know, shut out from these big bookings mm -hmm. simply because of like color of their skin or, you know, what the gender they identify as. Yeah. And I, I warned you a little bit earlier that we, we might do a bit, a bit of plugging, but we actually, our next event we're really excited about is on September 22nd, but we're working with this uh, other, um, you know, um, uh, underground or like underground brand called Tendencies, and uh, it's headed up by Kim On, who is um, is uh, someone that we really look up to and we're really excited to work with. And you know, she she's you know like um, um, been in the in the dance community um, for a long time now. She's an OG, um, and you know, really makes an effort to to make her brand and events like a platform for those um you know um uh, just like artists that are you know lgbtq and um yeah just like making a stand for them 
Yeah, I think it's also kind of important to, you know, just keep a space where people don't feel like they're going to be discriminated against for any reason, um, just so they can, you know, fully come out and express themselves no matter what. That's great. So we actually are running out of time for today, but um, I really want to thank Micah and Andrew for your valuable insights and advice and taking the time to be here with us today. We really appreciate it. It really was a pleasure and an honor. And to everyone watching, thank you for joining and participating in the discussion. If you missed a portion of the conversation or want to share it with others, you can find the recording on our UCLA alumni YouTube channel. And once again, thank you to our Blue, Gold, and Life members for making conversations and events like this possible. Enjoy the rest of Alumni Day online, and as always, go Bruins. Go Bruins.